Hello, this is uh, Dick Schultz, and I am um, going to talk to you this afternoon about uh, riparian and upland buffers. Uh, I am a professor at Iowa State University and uh, have been working with riparian buffer systems for more than 20 years. So what I'd like to uh, cover this afternoon is uh, why we need buffers. In other words, what's the problem out there in the landscape? Uh, what do buffers do? Why do we love them? What can't buffers do? They can't do everything. And what other practices work with them? And what are some of the barriers and constraints to, to uh, get more adoption, more wide scale, broad scale adoption? So the problem is um, associated with the continued loss of perennial plant cover. It's being replaced by annual crops. Fields keep getting larger, fence rows are gone, and there have been numerous reports in the last uh, two or three years that have, have uh, suggested very large um, continued clearing of land. For example, the Environmental Working Group in 2012 uh, suggested that 23.6 million acres of grassland, wetland, and shrubland have been converted to row crops between uh, 2008 and 2011. And you can see that that's concentrated in the, uh, in the prairie states and in uh, uh, parts in Iowa, Wisconsin, northern Missouri, as fields continue to get larger and larger. And what this ends up doing is that we're losing perennial vegetation in the landscape. And that perennial vegetation has the ability to slow down water and trap sediments. But with the, uh, with the loss of that perennial vegetation, that no longer occurs Water keeps collecting, concentrating, flows through the landscape. And these are pictures I took just recently in a storm here in central Iowa with just lots and lots of water moving across the landscape and associated with that, obviously you can see a lot of sediment and associated nutrients. And these gullies arise in fields all over the, um, all over the Midwest. Uh, these are pictures from uh, south southeastern uh, Iowa, and we've got similar pictures from northeastern Missouri, where we've done a lot of work. These are gullies that, that developed in just the last fall season between the harvest and prior to planting in the spring. And as you can see, there's a lot of sediment that has moved out of these locations. That sediment ends up moving to the streams. It flows through narrow forest strips that have not been designed as buffers, and it delivers large quantities of sediment, phosphorus, and other chemicals uh, to the streams. <clears throat> There's also uh, the uh, situation where people are planting right down to the edge of, of uh, stream channels, and that provides direct access. There's nothing there for the water to slow up water at all. And many of those unprotected banks collapse and erode and produce, again, tons of sediment. And we've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years and estimate that anywhere from 40 to 80% of the sediment in a particular stream may come specifically from bank erosion that's associated with the weakening of the bank, higher flow rates, et cetera. And then there are practices where we are uh, grazing uh, cattle uh, in the riparian zone. And that obviously has direct consequences on the landscape and especially on stream banks and water quality uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the streams. In one of my classes, we do a little exercise looking at the uh, loss and the amount of sediment that's being produced. This is an example of, of a uh, relatively small stream. Uh, and you see those big chunks of blocks of soil that have mass wasted, have uh, failed from the bank. And if you look at the bottom picture there, you'll see uh, those are approximately 20 feet by 5 feet by 4 feet, and there's another one that's 10 feet wide. Can you estimate approximately how much sediment that is? How much does that do those two blocks uh, uh, represent? Well, the big block represents about 18 tons of sediment. The smaller block, half that, 9 tons. So a total of about 27 tons of sediment produced just from those two blocks. This picture was taken two years ago. <clears throat> And those blocks are now completely gone and have moved downstream and obviously have been trapped in different places along the way, have, have uh, 
a messed up aquatic ecosystems in the process of their movement. And as a result of all this sediment movement, many of our streams are, are choked with sediment, have high nitrogen and phosphorus, and obviously aquatic ecosystems in a situation like you see in these two pictures uh, are completely, almost completely dead. And these are pictures from uh, uh, the Salt Creek or Salt River uh, Basin up in northeastern Missouri. So most Midwestern streams are badly polluted with sediment and nutrients and uh, other chemicals. And these flow into the Missouri and Mississippi River basins, which end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And as you may have seen just recently, the re latest report on the hypoxic zone is that it's larger this year than it was, uh, than it averages in uh, years past that uh, the dead zone this year is approximately the size of Connecticut, and that's twice as large as what uh, the nutrient task force of the Mississippi River <clears throat> is, trying to, uh, is trying to reduce the, the dead zone to. And as you can see from the lower left-hand graphic there, that the source of the, uh, of the nutrients, especially nitrogen, is basically from the Midwestern states, the farm belt, of uh, the Corn Belt of the Midwestern states. There are two different views of, of agriculture and the real cost of agriculture. The top view is, uh, has, and this, this just came up in the last uh, two weeks in our Des Moines, our local paper, the Des Moines Register, with two different uh, uh, gentlemen speaking on agriculture. Uh, the top gentleman is our president of the Iowa Board of Regents that control the, uh, the in-state universities here. And he's also a CEO of a large uh, diversified international agribusiness. And he says that the American farmer of today is the model of efficiency and productivity, single-handedly feeding 155 people. And our weekly trip to the supermarket ensures us that the safest and most reliable, we have the safest and most reliable food supply in the world. We have the highest quality and the greatest choices while paying the least <clears throat> of any global culture. And there, there lies the kicker to me is paying the least. What we're not looking at is the long-term costs of the efficiency that he's talking about. And then a local farmer from just up the road here um, on another day made it, these comments as part of his comments. Uh, he said, our current situation in farming here is not sustainable. We cannot continue to treat our soils like dirt. We know what we need to do, cover our soils year round, reduce tillage, slow water movement, and increase infiltration, and regenerate our soil organic matter. So using this uh, last gentleman, John Gilbert's suggestions, brings us to agroforestry and the benefits of riparian buffers and also in-field buffers. <clears throat> by adding relatively small amounts of perennial plant communities in the landscape, we can have a dramatic impact on water quality and stream aquatic ecosystems. Uh, and that includes not only, not only the uh, riparian ecosystems, but also in field buffers, such as the buffers that are being uh, worked with uh, experimentally in Missouri, and also ones that we're working with uh, that are primarily prairie plots uh, here in central Iowa, uh, as opposed to both uh, prairie or grass and forest plots in uh, Missouri. And we'll talk about those a little bit more a little later. So let's talk specifically about riparian forest buffer design objectives. And these are objectives that are uh, specifically from the uh, uh, FSA standard, the CP22 standard. And those are that it creates shade to lower water temperatures to improve habitat for aquatic organisms. So we recognize the importance of the aquatic ecosystem. They provide a source of detritus and large woody debris for aquatic and terrestrial organisms, which means basically they provide habitat and a food source. Detritus is a food source for the aquatic organisms. And they create wildlife habitat and wildlife corridors. And at least for those of us who live up in central Iowa uh, on this very wide open landscape, there is no habitat other than what we are able to create along uh, uh, riparian corridors uh, with forest buffers, riparian forest buffers. And then another objective is to reduce excess amounts of sediment 
organic material, nutrients, and pesticides in surface runoff and reduce excess nutrients and other chemicals in the shallow groundwater that's running below these buffers. So, whoops. All right. They're also designed to mitigate uh, flooding damage by trapping large debris and uh, waterborne sediment, and they slow flood waters and lower flood peaks, and, and we've seen that happen. Uh, farmers who don't have buffers oftentimes get a lot of debris out on their farm fields. Uh, with a woody buffer, uh, that material that is floating down the river often gets trapped, usually gets trapped in the woody component, and that, that's a, really of no consequence because it's basically organic matter and sediment that can be processed by that plant community. Uh, the, another objective is to restore natural riparian plant communities, increase carbon storage in plant biomass and soils of those buffers, and to provide a harvestable crop of either timber, fiber, fo excuse me, forage, fruit, or other crops consistent with other intended purposes. So those are the objectives that are outlined uh, in, the, uh, in the standard. The traditional model that was initially developed back in the late 80s, early 90s, suggested that the, uh, the buffer had uh, three zones. And the first zone was this undisturbed zone right along the creek. Uh, the goal here was to allow that vegetation to mature and fall into the stream to provide the large woody debris that's necessary for habitat in many streams. The second zone was the managed forest zone, uh, which would be harvested from time to time to remove nutrient storage and also provide income. And the third was the runoff control zone, which primarily consisted of a grass and or a prairie kind of, of uh, plant community. The widths uh, that were suggested were a minimum of 100 feet on either side and or 30% of the floodplain. Well, using that particular model uh, in some of the flat landscapes that we deal with was problematic because our streams are, again, running through a flat landscape, very, very low slope. We have tile as part of our system here. And if you throw a lot of woody debris into that channel, there's always a concern by the landowner that that may dam up the stream and uh, backwater up into the tiles. So in the uh, model that was modified for the Corn Belt, uh, we added just that the first zone was fast growing trees, then slower growing trees, shrubs, and native grasses and forbs with the idea that all the trees would be harvested from time to time, again, depending on the objectives of the landowner. The function of these different uh, plants the, uh, the trees would provide the vertical structure. They would provide uh, infiltration, high infiltration rates. They would provide nutrient storage, intercept subsurface pollutants, and take those up in the plant, provide carbon storage, strong woody roots, which could help to anchor banks and reduce uh, bank erosion, and then uh, provide shading for the stream and the aquatic ecosystem. The shrubs would also provide vertical structure. So you can see in this system here, there's all kinds of different vertical structure that's going to attract all kinds of different uh, birds and other species of and species of mammals. Uh, they are multi-stemmed, and that's a, a really a beautiful thing. If this is a nice, dense uh, row, a couple of rows of shrubs, when you do get a flood coming out of its banks and a lot of debris floating with that, it may get through the trees. But by the time it hits this, this uh, multi-stemmed set of uh, shrubs, the larger material is usually stopped and kept in here rather than out here where it can become a problem for the local landowner who's trying to farm that area. Um, and then the native grasses, again, provide uh, good cover, uh, habitat. They improve dramatically, improve soil infiltration rates, especially if you're uh, uh, constructing this or, or reestablishing this on old crop fields. They improve uh, soil tilt, um, uh, organic matter content, 
They provide habitat for uh, uh, beneficial organisms, uh, insects, etc., and they can help keep invasive species out of the landscape. Now, one of the constraints, one of the concerns that has come up, at least here in this state of Iowa, is that the interpretation by the, by the uh, federal government of the riparian forest buffer has changed over the last couple of years. Now they are looking at the riparian forest buffer as being primarily consisting of trees and shrubs with no grass zone. <clears throat> and we just ran into that uh, in, uh, in uh, the gentleman who is uh, trying to re-enroll the buffers that have been placed in our Bear Creek watershed. Uh, the, uh, uh, the concern that he's had based on this new interpretation is what to do with the grassed area. And what they're suggesting to him is that this grass area can now or should now be planted to trees and shrubs. In other words, we're taking the grass out and or just re-enroll the woody portion and not the grass portion. And the concern that we have with that is that the landowner could then come in and pull this back into the crop field, narrowing the buffer and creating uh, issues for uh, the effectiveness of that buffer. And again, we've seen what happens when you don't have a, a grass filter strip. Many forests, especially non-designed uh, riparian buffers, uh, or riparian forest buffers, uh, do not have such a high density of forest that there isn't a, a good permanent cover on the ground other than litter and water that comes as concentrated flow across the landscape here can easily penetrate that forest and create uh, gullies right through the forest, basically doing little for trapping the sediment and or the, the chemicals that are moving with that uh, water. So a grass filter strip is extremely important as to be as part of the forest buffer system. Uh, and that can be a well-designed, this is a, a, a non-native cool season buffer. Uh, we prefer the mixed um, uh, natural grasses and forbs uh, as, as being a, an effective system because it also provides significant wildlife habitat. And we've seen this happen in one of our early plantings where we planted silver maple very, very densely. And if you look at the ground here, uh, this is a picture that one of our students just took uh, who's doing some resampling out there. You can see a lot of bare ground in here. Only about 17% of the cover on the ground here is grass cover. And so we see a significant amount of surface runoff and actually erosion associated with raindrop impact on that, bare, on that bare ground. We took another plot of the same silver maple and cut half the trees out. And under there now we have 87% grass cover, which provides a nice frictional zone for water moving across that surface. And we don't get that runoff and we don't see the erosion from raindrop impact from the, from the tree canopy. Another concern that we have with the no grass zone is uh, grass waterways, which do an, an awesome job at controlling ephemeral gullies out in the field, but oftentimes those end up being uh, exited directly into a forest buffer system. And these again are pictures out of northeastern Missouri where a lot of grass waterways are just entering these narrow forest uh, corridors. And because they have no, <clears throat> they have primarily only litter on the ground, those, uh, the water which is concentrated moves quickly through the down the grass waterway can easily penetrate through that forest system and create uh, a, a gully. As a matter of fact, we uh, is that on this side? Yeah, we we actually did a survey here um, in northeastern Missouri, and we looked at 39 different grass waterways. 21 of those had significant gullies, classic gullies. This is, this is the well-developed gully, which is, uh, uh, takes a machine to, to correct it because it's so deep and incised, uh, passing through the uh, forest buffer. And we're then, we're already starting to move up into the grass waterways themselves. So again, a well-managed grass strip is critical to a riparian forest buffer and or we need to make sure that our planting density in this forest system here is light enough or is thin enough 
so that we get good perennial grass cover on the ground that can slow that water up. Now, some other design considerations, and I'm sorry I got a messed up uh, thing here. The, uh, the first one is there are obviously constraints on the site. There's the depth that the channel is incised, which means the depth to the water table. And in many of our Midwestern streams, the streams have now uh, incised or deepened enough so that we really don't have a true riparian zone because the water table is down more than a meter, maybe three or four feet or more. And that provides enough rooting depth and, and uh, less flooding uh, activity so that we can actually grow upland species in what used to be a riparian zone. <clears throat> Another constraint is the rate of widening. Uh, channels go through a normal sequence of activity as they have to carry more and more water from runoff. And the first is to deeply incise, then the next is to widen. And if they're in an actively widening phase, uh, it's very difficult to get enough plant material established quickly enough to slow that widening rate down. Uh, and so what that often suggests is that we need to have a wider tree component to a buffer and the trees that, that grow quickly and produce large uh, woody roots very quickly. Then as we've talked earlier about the uh, constraints associated with the new interpretation by FSA and NRCS, that's created some real issues. Uh, there are market opportunities, but they differ depending on the landowner's objectives. Where you have large uh, farmers with large corn and bean operations, uh, they don't have a whole lot of time to manipulate intensive uh, woody plant communities. And so they're looking for more long-term uh, plant uh, harvesting opportunities and, and oftentimes wildlife habitat. <clears throat> Whereas farmers with diversified crops can diversify even more by uh, planting species here that provide uh, woody, uh, that provide the nuts and berries that can be used for different uh, products. So for example, uh, in these diversified systems, we can plant decorative florals, which in two or three years, you can start harvesting and selling. Uh, nut trees can, can take uh, a number of years before they begin to produce, but they can provide a, an income from that buffer. Uh, fruit trees and berries, again, can be providing an income. Shrubs for jellies, possibility of mushrooms being grown, and then also timber uh, and biomass for, uh, uh, from trees that uh, are longer term in their production. So we have all kinds of different species that are available for production. We have all kinds of different shrubs that can be used. Some of these shrubs obviously are, are suited to different climatic zones, but again, there are many different fruits that are available that could be cultured and could provide a, uh, an income in addition to the other crops that are being grown uh, by that landowner. If the landowner is uh, looking at this in a more long-term setting, they need to occasionally have someone go in there and do some thinning and pruning to provide higher quality uh, end products from that site. And also to, as you can see here, provide a continuous grass cover uh, on the ground to keep it from eroding. Many of the buffers that we've had uh, success in selling uh, deal with primarily creating wildlife habitat. <clears throat> and again, by design, if we uh, take the trees out or keep fewer trees and, and keep it primarily native grasses, shrubs, uh, native grasses, forbs, and shrubs, we can stimulate that as upland bird habitat. Bringing in more trees will provide more forest game, turkey, deer, et cetera. How do these buffers perform? Why do we like them so much? In addition to providing uh, game habitat, they can remove 95% of the sediment and 80% of the nutrient load. Now, these, this is data from buffers that have a grass strip, as you can see, associated with this system here and that system there. So when you have that grass strip and the trees, you can reduce uh, input of sediment to the stream dramatically. Native grasses tend to do better 
uh, both uh, than uh, non-native cool season grasses alone, even though the cool season grass, non-native cool season grasses are easier to maintain. We've seen dramatic increases as others have in bird species use. And we've seen also flood mitigation and <coughs> flood, uh, the trapping of flood debris that landowners do not have to deal with. Soil qualities in these corridors uh, that allow this, this nice uh, uh, reduction in sediment and nutrient load because of higher or dramatic changes in soil quality along here, what we see is that we get increased or improved soil structure, higher infiltration rates, a lot of perennial root biomass, increased soil organic matter, beneficial microbes for, uh, that help uh, increase denitrification rates, and it's all about adding carbon and leaving the soil undisturbed in these corridors that provide the ecosystem services of filtering uh, materials out of water that's moving through there. So just a couple of, of uh, pictures here on success stories uh, that we've seen. The before picture up in the right-hand corner and the arrow pointing at the location of the bridge. You'll see here a broken down bridge back here. That same bridge is sitting here now and those banks are nice and stable. Um, here's that, I showed you a picture of, of uh, farming right down to the edge. That was this field right here. This is early on where, where a, uh, just a grass, a prairie forb filter has been planted and that bank now is, is nice and stable in through here um, because it is, is, has lost that annual um, uh, corn and bean cover. And along this long stretch here, they were farming right down to the edge um, and there were direct input locations, direct runoff moving right into the streams and those are no longer visible uh, because of the perennial plant community associated with that riparian buffer. So those are the, the positive things about buffers. What can't they do? Well, because they're riparian systems, um, and because they're plants that are dealing primarily with surface processes, they have a hard time reducing, they can't reduce nitrate in field tiles that are running through, this, through the uh, field here and under the buffer, exiting directly into the stream. They may not control stream bank erosion, especially on deeply incised channels. Uh, where rooting depth may not get deep enough to uh, deal with the undercutting that's going on with the water moving through the channel. Uh, they obviously um, can't reduce the movement of water and materials out here. They're primarily protecting that stream zone, uh, that, that riparian zone and the stream channel along that narrow belt of the stream. So they have no impact really on the field, on conditions out in the field. Uh, and they, they, um, uh, they can improve in-field, they don't improve in-field soil quality uh, that's associated with, with constant tillage, et cetera. So in this case, what we need are upland and in-field buffers to work in concert with the riparian buffer systems. And there's been some very good work done here at the University of Missouri um, and what they have found, some of the things, some of the many things that they've found is that grass buffers reduce herbicide transport up to 80% from surface runoff, that they also find native grasses uh, seem to work better than non-native cool season grasses, that switchgrass, they've seen switchgrass uh, have an, an impact of reducing atrazine in soils by 80% in as little as 25 days after application. Um, infield agroforestry practices uh, tend to reduce surface runoff or field runoff by 16% and soil erosion by up to 25%. So dramatic reductions in movement of materials and, and the filtering of materials by small segments of, of buffers being placed in the fields. <clears throat> we have a relatively new study that's about five years old now looking at strips of prairie uh, plants taking up 10 to 20% of fields, um, of crop fields, corn and soybean fields. And what we find there are very similar things. If you see here, oops, let me, sorry. 
If you see this top run here, this is row crop with no perennial plant strips in there. And you can see a dramatic export of sediment associated with that, uh, with the, uh, with those row, in those row crop fields. And these row crop fields uh, were no-till, are no-till fields. Where we have increased the cover of perennial plant communities by 10 to 20%, those are these curves down here. Basically, there's no movement of sediment out of those watersheds associated just by having these infield strips of uh, plants to uh, deal with movement in the field itself. Disregard that, that's supposed to say total phosphorus up there. I'm sorry about that. But we see the same thing here because, of, because sediment, phosphorus moves with the sediment, you'll see a dramatic movement of phosphorus where there are no perennial strips and almost no phosphorus movement where you have these uh, strips of um, perennial plant community present, the buffers, the infield buffers. What can you do with tiles that are moving below the, uh, below the buffer? Well, in, um, in the uh, central part of the state of Iowa anyway, there are what we call crep wetlands. These are large wetlands that intercept tile that uh, are draining a minimum of 700 acres, and uh, they're designed to reduce nitrate levels and do a very efficient job of that. There are bioreactors that are now being used uh, where a, uh, before the tile enters into the stream, the, it is cut and a um, ditch or a hole of approximately four feet in depth is filled with uh, wood chips and covered. The tile is drained through that Wood chip pile, soil is put back on top. You can walk, uh, you can uh, drive over the top, and in some cases, even cultivate over the top. Uh, and that has also proved uh, has proved effective at reducing uh, nitrate movement into the stream. We're working also with uh, saturated tile buffers, and in this particular case, this is one of the the buffer strips along Bear Creek. Uh, what you see here is that field tiles. Field tiles that are running directly into the stream like that. Um, we cut into this tile right here, put a control box in there, then put a distribution tile off of that control box so that water moving in here is going to move through this tile, which then drains through the buffer, through the soil in the buffer. And we've got observation wells here and find that we get dramatic reduction in uh, in the tile, I'm sorry, in the tile, uh, in the water quality of that uh, tile flow. And in the first year of, uh, it's now in, the, in starting, its, uh, th it's in its third year, uh, we were able to um, uh, divert 60% of the flow out of the tile through this distribution tile and uh, got a 90 plus percent reduction in nitrate as it moved through there. As we also mentioned, uh, sometimes buffers have a difficulty, especially when we're just trying to get them established in controlling bank erosion. And so there are numerous different bioengineering techniques. Again, this is one that uh, I use in a class where students are using uh, cedar revetments to stabilize the toe of the slope, sl cutting back the, the bank itself some. These are obviously practices that you use in areas that are, where there's some critical impact. There are so many miles of eroding banks that they're, it's not logical to use these in, long, in, in many long uh, stretches of stream. There are boulder weirs that can be put into the channel. And the goal of these boulder weirs is to raise the level of the water just slightly to maybe at most three feet, which reduces the height of the bank that's exposed which, redu which improves the structure and strength of that bank and reduces bank erosion. And those are oftentimes put into a sequence <clears throat> in a system like this and are effective at, at uh, reducing bank erosion because they have reduced the depth or the height of the exposed uh, banks. Riparian grazing, it can be as simple as continuing to graze in the riparian zone but as simple as putting a fence 15 to 20 feet off of the bank and allowing and planting and allowing shrubs to grow in and stabilize that bank. So 
In this particular case, we have a narrow fenced area here on the, on the right uh, uh, in the same field where we have uh, not planted, and you can see the difference in a relatively short period of time that helps to stabilize those banks. Now, constraints to adoption. I'm a believer, and I think there are a lot of people that now agree that volunteer adoption just does not work. With riparian forest buffers and buffer systems in general, if we're going to see measurable impacts on stream channels, we need to have a significant portion of that stream channel buffered. And that requires that basically everybody up and down that channel does something to buffer their particular uh, portion of the channel. Buffers are great at protecting and reducing the flow of material from an individual field, but to see downstream impacts, you need to have a significant length buffered. Early adopters have adopted it, but the problem is there are still many people that are not convinced or are not don't see the value or we haven't sold it well enough. Uh, and there still is a philosophy out there that this that there's a difference between soil and dirt and that streams really are there only especially smaller streams are there only to carry water off the landscape. We can see, as we mentioned early on, that CRP land, in addition to clearing land that wasn't in CRP, CRP land is also being cleared to put back into row crops uh, because of high commodity prices at the present time. We don't think there's enough flexibility in the standards that FSA and, and, and NRCS has put out. They basically have a one-size-fits-all design, and uh, that needs to be changed. And the way they're presently interpreting those standards is flawed. Um, climate change also challenges buffers down the road. We did a survey uh, as part of our strips, uh, as part of that infield buffer project that we've got going on, of what the general public thinks agriculture should provide. And you can see the values in this. Uh, 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 in uh, these issues that they've identified here are relatively similar. Uh, not, there's not a big difference between these, but what's interesting was interesting to us that there are many things that the public wants agriculture to provide in addition to crop production. And many of these things like drinking water quality, aquatic habitat, um, flood control, et cetera, et cetera, are provided by agroforestry systems along streams. So now climate change. And again, I screwed up here. Climate change. The, uh, the model, which was a, a report was prepared for the governor two years ago for Iowa. Um, and what it basically says is that we're going to get an increase of 20% in uh, precip and severity of storms. And that is going to result, and here is the real concern for us, that's going to result in a 50% increase in stream discharge, primarily because of the delivery of the water and the very large amount of area that is, uh, that is bare so much of the year. So a 50% increase in channel discharge means that channels are going to have to carry more water. What happens when a channel has to carry more water? Well, what happens is it's going to start to why it's going to continue to widen to to create a, uh, a, a channel that's large enough to deal with the uh, amount of water that we're pushing into it. And so we are presently again, th this is work that we're doing down in northeastern Missouri and other places, but this picture is from there. This is through a three and a half month period of time. We're measuring the amount of erosion, the amount of bank retreat. And you can see we've got some pins. There's a pin sticking out. There's a, a pin that's basically metal re-rod. And in that three and a half month period, over the winter months into spring, we've lost more than 20 inches of stream bank, that channel widening. Well, if we increase discharge because of uh, climate change even more, this model uh, is going to what happened to my arrow? This model is going to uh, accelerate the continued incision and widening of stream channels. 
And that's going to put a, that's going to be a challenge for us trying to uh, develop riparian forest buffers that are able to uh, contain this rapid expansion or widening that's going to take place. I think we're going to have to have wider strips of trees, uh, uh, especially fast growing trees that can get locked in as quickly as possible to try to slow down some of this, uh, uh, some of this channel widening. So buffers are going to have to get, uh, get wider. The woody zone is going to have to be wider, help slow down water, control floods uh, from faster and more frequent flooding that's going to occur. So in closing, what I'd like you to do is to look at this uh, 1992 picture of a portion of the, uh, the Bear Creek watershed. And this was the very first buffer that we put in in 1990. Um, and the rest of it is unbuffered. And you can see how close, look at the meanders down here. They're farming almost right down to the meanders. And here, same thing up here. And you can see there's a bypass channel. The farmer was actually farming in here and was farming in this area right here until the big 1993 floods that uh, uh, created some real issues. So keep that picture in mind. And now look at this picture, which was taken in 2008 and is basically the same as it is today. You can see the buffer down through here, a slight widening in through here, and this bypass channel has been buffered up here. How much land have we taken out of row crop production? Very, very little land, because a lot of this, like the area he was farming up here, gets flooded every once in a while, every three to five years, and you lose the crop anyway. This area in through here gets flooded. Some of this area in through here gets flooded. And so we're taking a relatively small proportion of the landscape out of crop production and putting it into a perennial plant community that can help to improve the quality of water and the aquatic system in the stream channel. So with that, I thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to uh, entertain those. Thank you. Uh, I type about- Hello. That. Can't hear us. Will this PowerPoint be? Ah, I see. I have to. I have to respond to typing. Okay. <clears throat> yes, this PowerPoint will make this PowerPoint available. So, uh, if you have questions, put them into like tweet, Twitter size, and I'll try to type them in there. So that if, if you want. How about this? What's the best way of specific specifically? <laughs> Here's my smart question. Can you use your cell phone? Yes, I think I can. Okay. Do I have it with me? Yes. Okay. What do I need to What do I need to do with my cell phone? I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what happened to my darn cell phone. I was charged this morning, but I can't get the darn thing to turn on. Ugh. This hasn't happened to me before. Naturally, it happens in a situation like this. Unfortunately, I'm not in my office. I'm in a, in a suite, um, a, a classroom suite here that doesn't have a phone. Again, I'm, I apologize. I wish I could be there with you.
How do we deal with tile drains? Well, we design the, the buffer uh, a little bit differently when it's passing over the top of tile drains <clears throat> uh, by putting in a, a grass. We basically have a grass waterway all the way down to the edge of the stream, and we back off the native grasses and, and the trees basically one plant height. Uh, tree root systems generally uh, extend one plant height out. For others, one of the reasons we're working with the uh, resaturated tile, I mean, the resaturated buffer is because we want to deal with tile and not have it flow directly. The tile outlets, we're now putting these boxes in. We're working on, on uh, putting these uh, cutoff boxes in and extending tile parallel to the buffers and allowing the water to move then through that buffered soil. We've also put in a couple of bioreactors uh, that are part of the buffer system, but really the buffer itself has, it, they just provide a place for those bioreactors. Uh, but with the saturated buffer uh, that I showed you earlier, um, we actually can, can treat, oops, right there. We can actually get the water to flow through the, the filter system itself and do what a buffer is supposed to do. And it does a, a good job of reducing nitrate. Yes, the distribution tile is perforated, correct. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we were able to dist we were able to treat 60% of the flow in that in the tile um, in the first year. I don't have the data for the second year yet. Yeah, that, yeah. Nobody in years when you don't get much rainfall, you're going to catch a lot more of the, dist of the tile flow, and so you'll get more treatment. In years when you don't, obviously, in years when you have a lot of rainfall, you're going to get less treatment, which is problematic. But that's one of the goals then of these larger crep wetlands is to, uh, where we have patterned, large pattern tile fields, is to treat those with these large wetlands. I'm doing this for, uh, this is exactly what you said. <laughs> you said exactly what you said. Acting like a big septic system. Yes. <laughs> Acting like a big septic system. <laughs> it's a good, a good way to put it. But the outcome is beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, again, I, I apologize for not being there. Uh, would have liked to have had more interaction with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye. Thank you.